Great. Get more of the singing coming from over here, I suppose. More people are more familiar with the hymn. It's okay. All right, I just want to say a few things about baptism before we do this. And um, while everyone gets their shoes off and everything, then we'll hopefully order some pizzas so they come around 12 o'clock. So, yep, great. We're going to be baptizing some people today. They're taking the first step of obedience to, to follow in the Lord's commandments. Um, so a couple of questions I'll just address about baptism that some people ask. You know, one is, you know, where should we, where should we baptize with water? You know, so people might ask, you know, should you get baptized in a baptismal? Do you need to get baptized in a, in, in a church building? Do you need to get baptized in a tub or in a river? Does it make a difference? Does one make one invalid? Does one make one valid? You know, some people might get baptized in a pool. Some people might get baptized in a, in a spa in the winter, you know. Um, some people get baptized in a bathtub. I know in America, some people get bath baptized in a, in a horse trough, you know, where it's just like a big sort of metal trough that they fill with water, the person sits in it. Um, or the way we do baptisms is, we, you know, we like to baptize people in a river, like we see in the Bible in the Jordan River. I don't think it really matters where you get baptized, you know, it doesn't, the, the location does not make it valid or invalid. I suppose it just comes down to practicality. If you think maybe in the times of the uh, first century, you know, people didn't have running water. They didn't have a lot of clean water that they can just easily dispose of. You know, maybe they're going down to the local well and getting some drinking water so they wouldn't fill a whole trough full of it and, and waste it all uh, on a baptism rather than using a natural body of water that's already there. So that could be possibly why um, in the Bible we see people using a natural body of water just because it was, it was convenient. I mean, it's there. You don't have to, to set it up. Um, so yeah, it doesn't really matter where you get baptized, you know, as long as you get baptized by uh, immersion, which is how we do it when you go under the water. And I'll explain that in a moment. But one thing we really want to make clear is people ask, is baptism required for salvation? Because a lot of churches out there, you know, you've got the Pentecostal church, you've got the Catholic church, the Orthodox church, all teaching that in order to be saved, you need to be baptized. You need to be, you know, quote unquote, washed with water. That's what they think the baptism represents, that you're going under the water, being washed from your sins. But baptism does not save. Baptism does not wash away sin. Only the blood of Jesus washes away sin. And that's what we believe in our church, because the Bible is very clear in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast. And it's interesting that that verse in the Bible is there, and yet how many people do you see, do, do you talk to, or priests or bishops that you talk to, and you ask them what must you do to be saved, and they say you have to do good works. You have to keep good works. You have to go to church. You have to get baptized. You have to try and live a good life. and try and get the sin out of your life. When the Bible's so clear, it's not of works, lest any man should boast. And people who claim to believe the Bible are almost preaching the absolute opposite. It's not of works. The Bible says to him, um, uh, sorry, it's, it's on the tip of my tongue. Um, ah, to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly. His faith is counted for righteousness. So you can see there, you believe and you don't work. It's by faith, it's not works. And that includes baptism. Baptism is a work. It's a commandment that we are to obey as believers, but it's not something we have to do in order to be saved. And I just wanted to share a couple of verses with you that I think, you know, besides the many, many verses in the Bible that teach that salvation is not by works of righteousness, but which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. Uh, verses like that in the Bible where it's, whosoever believeth, you know, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. So there are many verses in the Bible that teach us that salvation is by grace through faith alone. But I'll share a couple of, couple of verses with you here just to show uh, clearly that the Bible teaches that baptism does not wash away sin. This verse is from 1 Peter 3.21. It says here, The like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. So people will stop there and they'll say, Ah, see, baptism saves us. But if you keep reading in the, in the same verse, 1 Peter 3.21, it says here, Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So we are saved by the death, burial, and resurrection. And what the Bible is teaching us here is baptism is a figure of that death and resurrection. That's why we go under the water and we come out of the water. Because when you're standing in the water, that's Jesus on the cross. You go into the water, that's when they buried his body. You come out of the water, it's symbolizing the resurrection. 
So that's what the Bible is teaching there. It's saying we're saved by water, the figure which is representing the death, burial, and resurrection, because it's clearly saying it's not the putting away of the filth of the flesh. Because, you know, newsflash, water is not going to wash away your sin. You can, you, all of us, we probably take showers on a weekly or daily basis, however, you know, you do it in your culture. I used to do it daily, but then as I get older, it's like, oh, maybe I don't need to shower every single day. I'm washing away all my natural oils and things like that. Um, but yeah, that's besides the point. But my, my point is, you know, you, you can get washed as many times as you want. You know, you can dunk yourself in this river every single weekend, every single day. You know, you can have some holy man that you think has the power to forgive sin in a booth somewhere, try and, you know, sprinkle you and think that washes away your sin. But only the blood of Jesus Christ can wash away sin. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. So, clearly here, not the putting away the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. So you see, it's an answer. It's a response to something. The fact that you're saved. This is why we don't baptize children. We don't baptize children that don't believe. They need to confess Jesus Christ with their mouth. They need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And because of that salvation, they then, in an answer of a good conscience toward God, they then are baptized as a public testimony. Another one is in 1 Corinthians 1.14. Um, this is an interesting verse here where Paul says, I thank God that I baptized none of you, but Crispus and Gaius. Why? Because in the Corinthian church, everyone was starting to have a, per a cult personality where they're like, you know, I'm, a, this, I'm following this person. I'm of Paul and I'm of Cephas or whatever. And it's, it would be like today, people saying, oh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm part of the Tay church or I'm part of the, this church or that church. And, and getting called by people's last names rather than being called by Jesus Christ. We're Christians. We're, we're believers. We're um, um, saints using the words that Bible, the Bible uses as opposed to being called after a man. And that's definitely something we encourage in this church is that people follow the Bible. You know, even if I teach people things and I say something, that's how, that's how I've interpreted the Bible. That's how I believe the Bible is right. But, you know, it's up to you. You have the responsibility to then go and be like the Bereans and search the scriptures daily, whether these things are so, whether the things I'm telling you are actually what the Bible teaches. So you don't follow any man. You need to follow the Lord Jesus Christ and his word alone. So he says, yeah, I thank, that, I thank God that I baptized none of you, but Crispus and Gaius, lest any should say that I baptized in my own name. And I baptized also the house of Stephanus. Besides, I know not whether I baptized any other. Another interesting thing is a lot of people say that you know, bap baptism is only for the Jews because only Jews were baptized. Well, you can see here that Paul is baptizing Greeks. You know, Paul um, was the last apostle and he's baptizing people. So it is something for New Testament believers. But look at what it says here. He says, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. Now, let me ask you this. If baptism was required for salvation, why would Paul be saying, well, Christ didn't send me to baptize? Because if, if, if baptism was required to get people saved, man, we'd be baptizing everyone, right? Because you'd, you'd want to make sure that they're going to heaven. So why one of the greatest apostles in, in the New Testament is saying, well, when Christ sent me, he just sent me to preach the gospel. He didn't actually send me to baptize people. He baptized a few people, but then most of the people in the Corinthian church were baptized by other people. Because baptism is not required for salvation. What's required for salvation is that you hear the word of God. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And that's why Paul was sent to preach the gospel, to make known the mystery of the gospel so that people could hear those words, believe and be saved. Baptism was an answer of believing that. Uh, then you've got some other points as well. I'll read these as well. Matthew 3, 13. So it says here, Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? So this is John the Baptist. Jesus has now come to him to be baptized. And he's saying, man, you need to baptize me. Why are you coming to me to get baptized with water? Um, Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So some people believe that, hey, the purpose of baptism is to wash away sin. So then the question to ask is, well, then why was Jesus baptized? Jesus didn't have any sin. Jesus was God in the flesh, sinless. So he was getting baptized in obedience to the Father. He was, he was suffering 
John the Baptist to baptize him to fulfill all righteousness. It's a commandment that we are to do. And remember, salvation is not by works. So we don't get baptized in order to get saved because baptism is a work of righteousness. And it's pleasing to the Father. It's interesting here that the two times, I'm just calling off the top of my head, you know, on the Mount Transfiguration, you know, God said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. But the other time God said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased is when Jesus was getting baptized and starting his ministry. So yes, baptism is a commandment of God. It's not optional as a, as a believer. You know, it doesn't mean you're not saved if you're not baptized, but it is a command of God. It ought to be the first thing we do. And when you do it, hey, God is pleased. God is pleased when his people take a stand and, ta and take that stand of public testimony and saying, yes, I am going to identify with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus by being baptized with water. And the last one I've got here is um, in Luke 23. This is when Jesus is on the cross and he's between the two, th two thieves. Um, it says here, and one of the male factors which were hanged railed on him saying, if thou be Christ, save thyself and us. So one of the thieves on the cross is saying, man, if you're Christ, if you're the Savior, then get us down from here. Like, save us. Um, but the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly. So he's recognizing that he's a sinner. He's admitting that he's wrong. For we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man hath done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. So again, if baptism was required for salvation, I don't remember reading about the thief on the cross getting baptized before he, he died on the cross. Remember, they broke their legs and then they were crucified to death. So baptism is not required for salvation. Oh, my son's having a little dirt meal over there. So... Um, Baptism is not required for salvation and the thief on the cross is an example of somebody who and their dying bed or well, their dying cross, right? Believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. He just said to Jesus, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Not tomorrow or next week after you get baptized. He said, today you'll be in me, with me in paradise because he didn't have obviously the opportunity to get baptized. So, and you know, what about every believer before the before John the Baptist. You know, John the Baptist came 2,000 years ago. Many people lived th thousands of years before that. How did they get saved if baptism wasn't even around? So baptism does not save you. Only believing on the Lord Jesus Christ saves you. It's not of works lest any man should boast. It's very easy to get that. Very easy, sorry, to be saved. It's easy to get baptized too, by the way. So people, believers that are holding it off, you kind of think, well, you know, it's, it's not really hard. There are many things in the Christian life harder than, you know, the outward things. You know, sometimes we stress about like what, what we wear and whether we're baptized and what we do. Those are the easy things. The hard things is loving your, loving your spouse as, you know, as Christ loved the church or, you know, as a, as, a, as a wife submitting to your husband as the church submits to Christ. These are the hard things. You know, loving your brother, you know, with the sort of love that God loved us with. These are the difficult things. Now, getting baptized is easy. You know, it's like, almost like, it's like a little bit of work, you know, just to step into a river and, and go underwater. Um, okay, so what, what's the significance of being baptized with water? So I'll just cover these quickly, um, just because I sort of touched on them already. But let's, I'll read here from Luke 3, verse 15. And as the people were in expectation, and all men mused in their hearts of John, so John the Baptist, whether he were the Christ or not, John answered, saying unto them all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I cometh, the latchet of whose shoes I'm not worthy to unloose. So he's saying, I'm not even worthy to untie Jesus' shoes. Um, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and will gather the wheat into his garner, but the chaff he will burn with fire unquenchable. So again, he's referring to there the saved and the unsaved. Those who are saved will be gathered into Jesus' arms and those who are not saved will be burned with fire unquenchable. Hell is a terrible place. And that's why you want to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ today because if you leave salvation till too late, you may end up dying and going to hell. It's a terrible place. Um, 
So baptism, one thing baptism with water represents is it represents what happens actually spiritually. When a person believes on the Lord Jesus Christ, they actually baptize with the Holy Ghost into the body of Christ. So we don't see that happen. We don't see the baptism of the Holy Ghost. It manifested in the early days, I believe, with the apostles because the word needed to get out. There were signs in order to confirm the word. But now we get baptized into the body. We know from the word of God that when we believe on Jesus Christ, we're now part of that body because of the baptism of the Holy Ghost that Jesus Christ does. And that's what baptism with water represents. It's the physical manifestation of um, that spiritual uh, reality, that spiritual truth, if that makes sense. It symbolizes what actually happens spiritually. Sort of like the, the ordinance of the bread and the cup. You know, a lot of churches will practice what they call the Lord's Supper or communion. Because when you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you partake of his flesh and of his blood spiritually, you know, by, by believing on his word. And that's what that ordinance represents. That's what it signifies. Um, the other thing is in Romans 6, 3, it says here, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ. So there's that being added to the body of Christ um, as, as we believe on Christ. Were baptized into his death. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. So I believe Romans 6 is talking about this spiritual baptism. We're baptized into his death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead from the, uh, by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. So a few things in that passage. One, when we're baptized, we are added to the body of Christ. Um, number two is we're buried into his death spiritually as well. Number three is because we figuratively are being buried in the likeness of his death because he took on flesh, he took on the nature of Adam, it's saying, hey, when we are resurrected in the last day, when we get our new bodies, we will be like him as he was resurrected. And this is what the baptism with water represents, because the reality is we're baptized spiritually, baptized spiritually into the body. And one day we will take on this new glorified body, but that will be in the future for those that believe on Christ. So baptism adds you to the body of Christ, but it doesn't add you to a church. Because oftentimes, sometimes people will, you know, they'll go to a church and they'll say, well, I want to become a member of this church. And what do they say? Well, you need to be baptized into the membership. And what they're, what they're not distinguishing between is when you're baptized into the body of believers, which is every believer everywhere, as opposed to a church, which is a physical congregation. Like we are actually a physical group of people that gather, that congregate. And this is why we are a church and people that congregate with us are part of that church. Now, believers that don't congregate with us are not part of that, are not part of this church. So within this church, there's an authority structure. You know, there are bishops and there can be deacons and things like that. There are decision makers that, you know, the, the, the church that the Bible exhorts us to submit under if you are part of that church. But I don't have authority over another church, right? And this is where the Catholic Church gets it wrong because they think the body of Christ is this one big church. So they think one guy has authority over every single believer in the whole world. Uh, which is not the case. And the reason why that is, is because, you know, obviously Jesus knows that people are sinful, that people uh, don't always follow his word. And when you centralize things, you end up corrupting everything. So when you have one organization calling the shots, if that organization goes corrupt, if the head goes corrupt, then generally it corrupts all the churches that follow it too. So that's, this is why we believe in independent churches. So that if one church goes off, off the cliff, they're not taking us with them. And likewise, if we go off the cliff, we don't pull down other churches that are believing and preaching the truth. So baptism with water doesn't add you to a church because a church is a physical congregation. Now, should baptism by water be by sprinkling or by immersion? What do I mean by that? Immersion is when you actually go underneath the water. Sprinkling is when they might use a cup, they might pour, they might take a little bit of water and just like splash you with it or put some on your head. Um, now think about it. If baptism represents a death, burial, and resurrection, how do you represent that with a little bit of water? How do you represent that with a sprinkling? So the reason why they get this idea is because they think that baptism is similar to the sprinkling of blood in the Old Testament on the altar. But that's not what baptism represents. Remember we read the verses. It represents the death, burial, and resurrection. 
So this is why it is by burial. And every example in the Bible we have is by burial. When Jesus was baptized, he came up straight way out of the water. You think of Philip and the, and the Ethiopian eunuch, they both went into the water and then he baptized them. Now, if it wasn't by immersion, what, what was the need of getting out of the chariot and going into the water? He could have just went and got a cup of water and baptized him in the chariot. No, because it's representing that death, burial, and resurrection. That's why um, it's by immersion. Now, who should be baptized with water? So let's read this uh, passage from Acts 8 um, in verse 35. Then Philip opened his mouth. So this is Philip preaching to the Ethiopian eunuch, by the way, as he's in his chariot. He says, And began at that same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? So the Ethiopian eunuch is saying, Hey, there's water here. What's stopping me from getting baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. So as you see there, they both went into the water because he wanted to immerse him, not um, pour him. And it's funny because I, I remember when I was going to a, um, a, a Protestant church, a Bible Presbyterian church, um, I remember the, the preacher telling me once, oh, you know, they have pictures of people standing, because I was saying to him, well, wait a second, didn't, wasn't Jesus in the water when he got baptized? You know, the Ethiopian eunuch and Philip, they went into the water to get baptized? How, how can you justify sprinkling? Like, surely if, if Jesus was buried with water, like, I would want to be buried with water. It's not like I'm going to correct Jesus. Like, because surely, like, if, if John was doing it wrong, let's say John was sprinkling, you'd think Jesus would have stopped him and said, no, like, you're going to baptize me the right way. You're not going to ba baptize me the wrong way. But he, I remember this preacher telling me that, you know, they had pictures of two people standing in the water and yet somebody would just get a handful of water and just put it on their head. I was just thinking, what's the point of standing in the water if you're just going to put a little bit of water on their head? You may as well bury them in the water. Um, so since it represents salvation, you know, since the, 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 the baptism with water symbolizes what happens to you when you're saved. It makes sense that you only get baptized once you're saved. So some people, you know, maybe you come from a Catholic or an Orthodox background. You, you think, well, I believe on Jesus Christ now. I'm already baptized because I was baptized when I was a kid. No, because in order to get baptized, you have to believe. Remember when the Ethiopian eunuch asked, what doth hinder me to be baptized? Philip said to him, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. So uh, Philip was checking with the Ethiopian eunuch first, do you believe? If you believe, then you can be baptized. This is why children, like really young children, don't get baptized because you know they don't believe. Unless they actually believe themselves, then they can be baptized. And you have to get baptized once you're saved because you know we all we've all gotten wet before. We've all maybe gone swimming or had a bath. That doesn't make us baptized. You need to be saved, and then your baptism represent that salvation that you have received freely by grace. All right, when, when should a person get baptized? Let's read here from Acts 10, 43 and 48. It says here uh, in Acts 10, Peter preaching here, To him give all the prophets witness, that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. So here's another verse. It's not that whosoever is baptized shall receive remission of sins. It's to, who, to him give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word, and they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. Oh, it's Gershon calling me. Does somebody want to call Gershon and ask, find out what he, what he wanted? <laughs> um, where was I? Um, and they of the circumcision which believed were astonished as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him to tarry certain days. You know, this is another passage that shows that the disciples, Peter did not believe, that baptism saved because these people while he was preaching they received the holy ghost they were saved and then he says oh i can see that they're saved now because they've received the holy ghost then he commands them to be baptized otherwise it'd be the other way around right they'd say well these guys should get saved get baptized then the holy ghost would 
come on them as opposed to the other way around. So we see here that once they were saved, they got baptized instantly. There's no reason to delay baptism. I mean, at our church, if people want to get baptized straight away, they can. But sometimes we have an event like this just so we can make it a bit more special um, if they are wanting to do that. But I don't intentionally delay anyone. If we've had people come from Brisbane, they want to get baptized. We just came down to this river and we baptized them. Um, so we don't need to delay it unless people want to make it a bit more of a special event like today. So... There are seven other instances of believers in the Bible getting baptized immediately. I won't uh, go through all the verses, but you've got the Jews at Pentecost. You've got Simon the sorcerer was baptized straight away. The Ethiopian eunuch that we, we read about where he, he was preached Jesus and then he went into the water and got baptized straight away. Um, even Paul, you know, Paul three days later on the road to Damascus got baptized. So, you know, Max, it was three days later. If you believe he got saved then, if you believe he got saved when he went to Damascus, then it was instantaneously. And then you've got Lydia and the Philippian jailer. And you know, there are, there are, other, there are other reasons why churches delay baptism that I don't believe are scriptural. Uh, one is they think it's your knowledge of the faith. So they'll say you need to learn a bit more about Christianity, learn a bit more about the fundamentals of the faith before you get baptized. But that's not what baptism represents. Baptism represents your salvation, the starting point of your walk with Christ. It doesn't represent your your walk in the future with Christ and, and your knowledge of the scriptures. So that should not stop you from getting baptized. And some churches, uh, like the church that I used to go to when I first got saved, they would make you sit through a 26 week basic Bible knowledge class before you could get baptized. So it wasn't only, you know, did you believe, do you know, but also the commitment to be there at 9 a.m. every morning to sit through that class, because if you didn't attend enough classes, you weren't allowed to get baptized at the end of it as well. So that is totally unscriptural. It's like, you know, it's representing salvation, which is not by works, yet you have to work for your baptism. You know what I mean? Like, how does that make sense? So it doesn't represent your knowledge of the faith. It doesn't re represent your commitment to a church. It's not, you know, we're trying to see how many times you come into church and if you're committed, then you get baptized. No, there are people, you know, you get baptized and we never see you again. It doesn't matter. You know, I mean, it does matter, but I'm saying it doesn't change the fact that you're not baptized. It shouldn't stop you from getting baptized. It doesn't, it doesn't stop you from being saved. You know, obviously God would want you to get baptized and, and stay in a church and, and live for him. But my point is it doesn't, it, it shouldn't be representing your commitment to a church. Um, it's not representing your willingness to live right. You know, it's not representing your works like we talked about. Um, and it's not representing your age either. Some churches have an arbitrary age where it's just like if you have to be over 12 to get baptized. But then if you're saved when you're 10 years old, why, why should a church stop you from obeying the Lord? You know, the, if the Lord wants you to get baptized once you're saved, who, who am I to stand in the Lord's way and say, no, you, you can't get baptized because you're not old enough. Um, so for me, it's just about having assurance that they actually do believe. So, you know, that's why my children, I don't believe are saved yet, but when they get to the age where they can confess and believe and understand, then no problem. If they want to be baptized, they can be. So I'll just end on this last point um, while we get ready. But some people ask, some people have been baptized in the past and they always ask the question, is my baptism valid? Because they kind of think, you know, I, I went to a church that maybe believed different things. Um, I don't know whether the guy that baptized me was saved or not, or, you know, he believed he was off on this thing or that thing. Should I get baptized again? I'll tell you what my opinion is on what makes a valid baptism, according to what I know about the Bible. But I think there are two, two just two factors, I think, that make a baptism valid. One is, is it, it's by immersion. So if you're sprinkled, you weren't really baptized, because I don't think that actually represents what happened when you were saved. And the other thing is that you were actually saved when you got baptized because it represents salvation. Therefore, if, you're, if you weren't saved and you then were baptized like as a kid or something, then I don't think that baptism is valid and you're not actually baptized yet. I personally don't think who baptizes you invalidates your baptism. Why? Because I don't think it can be applied consistently. Let's say you think, well, you know, you say, well, you have to be baptized by somebody that's saved. But then how do you even know if that person is saved? Like, how do you even know if I'm saved? You, know, you don't know whether I'm saved. You can believe that I'm saved. I know that I'm saved. God knows that I'm saved, but you don't know that I'm saved. So if your, if your baptism is dependent on somebody else, how can, you, how can it ever be truly valid? Because you don't know. What happens if you find, okay, you're baptized by me today, and then you find out five years later, oh, I'm, actually, I'm not actually not saved. I'm actually some false prophet and whatever. You know what I mean? So then do you have to get baptized again? So to me, it's, 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 to me what validates baptism is, are you saved? 
Are you representing the death, burial and resurrection by the way you were baptised? But who baptises you does not, does not really play an important part. It's more an issue of conscience. If you feel that you have not, that's what baptism is about. It's about obeying the Lord. So if you feel that, hey, being baptized by this guy that you know now was a false prophet, or maybe you didn't really know whether you were saved back then, and you have some doubts as to whether you have taken that step of obedience, you may want to get baptized again just to know, hey, you know what? I'm not sure whether I've obeyed the Lord. I've got some doubt in my heart. So I'm just going to get baptized to know that I have obeyed the Lord scripturally. So <clears throat> that's the real issue. You know, some churches, um, you know, I think are wrong that will, they will not baptize you even though you believe you haven't been scripturally baptized. Like you might say, I think I need to be baptized again, but then they think, no, no, you've already been baptized. So I'm not going to baptize you. I think if, if um, churches should allow people to, to exercise their conscience and obey the Lord and have a clear conscience before the Lord. So I leave that judgment up to the believer themselves. And another thing we talked about when we talked about, you know, baptism doesn't add you to a church. Sometimes in churches, baptism is like the gateway to other ministries. Meaning like, you know, only if you are baptized and you can participate in this or participate in that, or you can lead the songs or you can break bread with us or do this or do that, serve in this ministry, serve in that ministry. This is not what baptism should be. Baptism is remember, representing your salvation. It's not this ticket to other ministries in the church. And sometimes this is where this question really stems from. Because when people start thinking, is my baptism valid? It's generally like, well, does that add me on to the membership role of this church? Does this baptism allow me to serve in this ministry? Am I truly baptized? Can I then partake in the breaking of bread and the cup with this church? But if that's not what baptism is about, then it's more about just you and God, your conscience before God. Have you obeyed the commandment to fulfill all righteousness in your life by being baptized after salvation and by immersion? All right, so that's all I've got. I hope that gives you a bit of information about baptism and, and teaches you today what this is representing. And then um, uh, we'll pray and then we can uh, start getting ready and you can get your shoes off and, and then we'll baptize some people. All right, let's pray. All right, thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for the guidance you give us. Um, we thank you, Lord, that, uh, you know, we don't have to figure out all everything ourselves. We can, we can study the Bible and learn of you as you give us example after example in the Bible of how we are to do things. Uh, pray, Lord, that you just give us extra wisdom and your Holy Spirit would teach us as we study your word. We thank you, Lord, for the people today that have decided to take this step of obedience and this public witness to um, be baptized in your name and i pray lord that this step is the first step of many great things that they'll do for you that lord that they would use the talents and pounds in their life uh, to serve you and to multiply them and lord help us all to be a witness for you to preach the gospel boldly and um, to get others saved so that they will not go to hell we love you, Lord. We thank you for your blood. We thank you for what you've done. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.